and welcome to South to North, coming to you from Johannesburg, South Africa. Imagine a spider web transformed into a heart muscle, a car that cleans itself, or a pile of rubbish turned into medicine or fish food. It sounds like something out of a science fiction novel, doesn't it? But these are real life examples of what can be achieved if we look to nature for solutions. Here in Africa, we call it biomimicry. But to many of you watching in the developed world, the term is bionics. Whatever the name, the idea is the same. Organisms and ecosystems can provide innovative solutions to some of the most difficult challenges facing humankind today. Nature may have been around for billions of years, but the science of mimicking is new. Harvard University recently invested hundreds of millions of dollars in an institute dedicated to biomimicry. And here in Africa, Nigeria has announced it wants to build a whole city based on biomimicry principles. Well, to tell us more, I have with me one of the world's leading innovators in the area, Professor Gunther Pauli. He's a UN advisor and holds professorships at universities across the world, including the prestigious Tohoku University in Japan. He's authored 20 books, including this bestseller. And his children's stories on nature and science are modern day classics printed in over 100 languages. Good evening to you, Professor Gunther. Very lovely to have you here with us. Let's Thank start you. with the definition. What is biomimicry? Biomimicry, we will find many different definitions, but the simplest is nature has solved all the issues that we're facing. We inspire by nature. We apply it to our human environment. Isn't that information and knowledge that has been there for billions of years? The idea is just not new. Well, you know, everything that we need for food, for water, for housing, for energy, for health, you know, everything that we need actually has been resolved by natural systems long time before we came around. I mean, there's some very basic observations we can make, like in nature, no one is unemployed. What a nice principle. I mean, we seem to think that we need to have an employment as a part of our modern society of globalization. So if you go and look at nature, there is always energy around, everywhere, locally supplied, and you don't need to have a connection to the grid and you don't have to have backup batteries. Give me an example of how biomimicry has been used internationally in a sustainable way. I think one of the great examples is silk. You know, we have learned how to farm silk through the mulberry. But the best silk that, uh, and the strongest type of silk is actually made by a spider. The problem is spiders, they are not easily domesticated. So the science of Professor Fritz Volrath has permitted us to understand how you can change the silk from the mulberry worms into the strong silk of the spider. And, and now that is a breakthrough in terms of medical sciences because it allows us indeed to, for example, have nerves regrow through a silk tube. Now, if you have severe nerves, also, for example, in the neck, I mean, you're a paraplegic. Now, we have learned that by creating those tubes of silk, the nerves will regrow again into those tubes. Um, now, let's think for a moment about the big use of titanium, mm -hmm. shaving. When I shave, I have most likely a three or four or even seven blades that you know, secure that my beard is uh, going to be cut very tight and very short. Now we do that with titanium. What do we do with the titanium? We throw it away. We have 100,000 tons of titanium that we just discard into landfills because after it's not smooth anymore, we just throw it away. There's no recycling. Now, silk threads pull together in a roller, you can roll it over your face, and it takes off exactly the same way. But if we were to need now 100,000 tons of silk instead of titanium, then we have to regenerate five million hectares of mulberry forests. Mm -hmm. Now, what's the beauty of it? The ecosystem is never generating one benefit only. We're not only getting the silk from the silkworm, but the silkworm has its droppings, and the droppings regenerates the topsoil. And as a result, by shaving with silk in the future, instead the of titanium. doing the titanium, now, the titanium mines may not like that very much, um, but we have to look at the sustainability of our Earth. The processing of energy required for the same function is 60 times less. 
It sounds to me that you are suggesting methods that are friendly to the environment. Isn't that the same as the green economy? It's not only friendly, it is much better than friendly. Tell me it how. is regenerating. How is it different? Well, see, our world of globalization has led to a situation whereby whatever is bad for you is cheap. And whatever is good for you is expensive. And the green economy, we've been telling consumers, pay a little bit more because it's good for the environment. But isn't but when, that true? Well, but if it is more expensive, it's for the rich. And what did the rich make money with? They made money by doing something that was not so good for the earth. So what we're in need of is learn from how the ecosystems always have multiple benefits, how everything will generate more than you had before. Because natural systems always evolve from simplicity to complexity. That's the way nature has been evolving from a few bacteria to a hundred million different species, all living happily together in diversity. And so what we're in need of is to see how could we turn our business models around? How could we turn our economies around? So we're not chasing junk made overseas at a very low price eliminating the jobs and having the environmental damage. We're needing to see how we can generate so many more benefits that the costs. Professor Gunta, if I understand you correctly, you're saying that the green economy has limitations. It is concerned with the short term and it's more expensive. And in future, businesses should be adopting the blue economy. Tell me how. The blue economy means that you use what is locally available. You're not going to imagine in this globalized world again and again that we can import things from South America, we can ship it to China and we can buy it here. You're going to start with what you have. It's one of the greatest principles that nature gives us. Nature works with what it has available. Great principle. But then we think that we don't have enough. Well, it is because we don't see what we have. We've been focusing so much on this core business with this core competence where we only produce the same product in higher volumes at ever lower costs. And because of that, we have all these externalities, all these problems that everyone has to solve because the business wants cheap, fast, low quality. So what are you suggesting? That from its core business, a business can get multiple sources of revenue by using waste, for example, to generate other income, other industries? By not thinking that you have waste. One of the greatest principles of nature is it doesn't exist waste. The only species on Earth capable of making something no one desires is the human species. All right, here's a problem. I understand that the arms industry is at, a, is at the forefront of a lot of development in biomimicry. Isn't that um, a problem for you? Look. The arms industry in the 1950s funded the first biomimetics institute at the University of Reading in the UK, and that's fine. I think while there are people using it for military purposes, it is nothing new. I mean, even in the 1900s, we learned how to change the suits and the dresses and the outfits of the soldiers because they were in red or in blue, uh, but now they decided to change the colors so they could fit in nature. But that to me is not the issue. To me, the real issue is that we are able to take these concepts of organization, like there is no waste, we have no unemployed, everything contributes to the best of their capabilities. That's what nature does all the time. There are no elderly homes in, in a natural, in natural system. An old tree contributes to the best of its capabilities, just like a little treeling does. But then you have the technicalities, the way that actually it is operationalized, um, where and the military and society can do it. It's a pity that only the military pays so much attention to it. I so it doesn't business. necessarily make the principles bad. It simply means it's an industry that adopted good principles that everyone should be adopting. That's everyone, what everyone. I mean, it's like quality control. Do you only want to do quality control in the military? No, quality control should be applied to all industries. So, so, so you said earlier that the green economy is expensive, that, uh, that it's expensive to be green. How cheaper is it to adopt the blue economy? Well, if I have coffee, mushrooms, animal feed, and then the animals give me manure from which I can make biogas, I have four revenues instead of one. The economy needs things to be cheaper. The cost must go down. 
but not by pressing the social and the environmental, but by generating more revenues. I think this is the best time to bring in our next guest because I know he feels very, very strongly about creating food, creating sustainability using nature. Being able to turn biology into design is not an easy task. Making these designs instrumental in a bigger scheme to end poverty is even more difficult. But our next guest is working hard to do just that. A civil engineer, biomimicry professional with experience working for humanitarian organizations across the continent, Gameli Hesibanda, is on a quest which is nothing less than to design Africa out of poverty. Welcome, Gameli. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Have Thank a seat. You. I'm very interested to hear what this is about. Designing Africa out of poverty, that sounds like a mammoth task. How do you propose to do that using biomimicry? Now, let's talk about food, for instance. How are we going to feed ourselves? And if you look at how the agricultural revolution has happened in the past centuries, we've cleared lands, fell down trees, cleared everything, and came up with machines to grow food, monoculture, in other words, growing, uh, growing uh, the same uh, crop on large scale land. And what happens in the process? We start taking out nutrients and depleting nutrients, and then we come with fertilizer, and we throw in more chemicals, and some of those chemicals end up fouling our water sources. Some of them end up uh, taking away the nutrients, and then we throw in more chemicals, and we're possibly now on the verge of not knowing what to do next. Mm -hmm. But how, nature, how would nature do it? Nature would grow different kinds of uh, uh, food, uh, types of uh, crops on the same land so that they exchange nutrients. Someone takes something else, the other one puts it back and it creates a balance in the whole system. But isn't it a reflection of the desperate times, that people are hungry, they want food now, so faster is better? Well, faster is better, but uh, if the end game is a zero-sum game, then there's no point in doing it. Mm -hmm. The problem we have with most of our human cleverness is that we concentrate on making one thing so perfect, we forget the whole value chain about the destruction that will face us downstream. Mm -hmm. I mean, give you an example. Um, let's say in the built environment. We build our houses. We never think what will happen the day we don't want those houses. So we then come late and put dynamite and blow them up. But nature wouldn't do that. Nature would look at using the materials in terms of how they are manufactured, using low energy processes, locally available materials. And eventually when you are done with whatever you, 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 you have constructed, it must go back and be recycled. This continent in particular, Africa, has a lot of problems. We need housing, we need shelter, we need medical advances to, to treat some of the diseases that we have. Can biomimicry be the answer? An example which comes from Africa, let's say um, Benin, where they used to have a problem with uh, waste from the upper tours, the slaughter of uh, animals. And uh, they would get flies all over the shore floating and laying eggs on, on, on this uh, waste uh, meat. And uh, someone one day had a bright idea and said, hang on, rather than just have the, 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 the flies uh, laying eggs and developing maggots, what can we actually do with these maggots? And then they figure out that actually the maggots, they've caught an enzyme that accelerates the healing process of a wound. I wouldn't have thought of uh, maggots <laughs> in that way. But. Well, they didn't stop there because they figured out, okay, if we, if we grow these maggots under, of course, a controlled environment and we harvest the maggots and we flush them through a salty solution, they will uh, give, out, uh, give up this uh, enzyme. And then we can actually put this enzyme in a proper uh, container, just like all the modern uh, medicines. Medicine. Yeah. Wow. And then you can then go and impregnate your, your, your bandages or whatever with this kind of material and accelerate. What do you think of uh, Professor Gunther's blue economy? Well, that's exactly the, the thing where you are saying, rather than just focus on one element of, 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 of the food chain or the value chain, at every stage there are benefits that you can reap out of the system. Professor Gunta is smiling because that's what you'd <laughs> said earlier. But tell me about this biomimicry city planned for Nigeria. What is that all about? Well, this is exciting news because most people, when they hear about uh, innovation, they think Europe and the developed world. 
And here is something that Africa is going to teach the rest of the world. They are going to develop a certain part of Abuja, which is still virgin land, using uh, biomimicry principles. Form is going to follow flow in the sense that how would nature want to do it? You got a river there, how would the river want to flow? First of all, let's consider that. And then we come with our development to fit with what nature already wants to do. We can talk about the materials themselves that would be utilized to mm -hmm. actually construct the, the, the shelter or the various uh, uh, buildings that would be there. Those materials would obviously have to be locally sourced. You also have to think about the energy. Where is the energy going to come from? How will this energy be utilized? What other benefits can be derived after we have used the energy for a particular process? I'm interested to know, I mean, experts such as yourself, you really look excited talking about uh, this biomimicry city. For the ordinary people, I mean, who will be going there? What will it look like? And how do they become a part of these exciting processes that you're talking about? Well, one thing that needs to happen there, um, people obviously need to be reconnected with nature. And I remember, I, I, I was born in nature myself, and then I spent 17 years going to school, being uneducated about nature. In fact, you said you lost the connection, thinking that you are going into civilization. Yes, I, I, I thought uh, I was going to civilization. I mean, I used to wake up in the morning, just go behind to the bushes, and there was a specific tree which we used to make a toothbrush our own equivalent natural toothbrush. And we use that, and then there were some uh, other leaves I would chew to get the nice aroma that comes with that. If I was sick, I knew where to just get something and, and treat myself. Often my mom would say, ah, oh, how is your stomach ache? I didn't need to tell her I had a stomach ache. She would just see me taking the natural medication that was there. So all those things, people need to be reconnected with nature. All right, we have another guest joining us. I mentioned him earlier, Michael Pierce who's our final guest tonight on the show. He is an African architect who saw the potential in mimicking nature long before his peers. Zimbabwean by birth, Michael Pierce has undertaken projects across the world. He recently arrived back from China, where he's been advising some of the world's biggest developers on how to build energy efficient apartments. Welcome to Michael. Thank you, Michael. Welcome back. Have a seat here, please. So let's talk about China and biomimicry. How prevalent is it in China? The Chinese are very interested. They're interested because they're developing at a fantastically fast rate. Um, they're worried about their two biggest problems, which are water and energy, which they're running out of. Um, and they're under huge pressure to, to, to develop. They're urbanizing. They're building great cities. Mm -hmm. um, and they are f probably leading the world now in the production of solar systems, renewable energy. And I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated with that. I think they're amazing people. That, that's actually very fascinating to me because often conventional wisdom would say that uh, development and sustainability are mutually exclusive, that if you're going to be the biggest and the fastest growing economy in the world, then you need to jettison all ideas of sustainability. But China, having been the fastest growing economy in the world, is demonstrating that it is possible. They're beginning to, yeah, in a big way. They're probably developing faster. And I mean, the, 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 you, you notice that the, the cost of PV photovoltaics has suddenly dropped because the Chinese are developing cheaper and cheaper solar energy collectors. How do you bring in biomimicry into architecture? Well, um, uh, I, I, was, I became interested in, in termites. Um, when I was asked to design a large office block, um, I watched a program by David Attenborough, and I saw him climbing around inside a termite's nest. And I just thought, wait a minute now, these termites can control the humidity and the temperature in a very small range in a climate which, in which the external temperatures go up and down. If they can do it without connecting a plug into the wall. Mm. Saving money and energy. Yeah. If they can do it, then we must be able to do it. And I thought actually at that time that you, we must be able to make a form which did it somehow, as we were saying earlier, that um, 
you, you don't copy the form, you copy the process. The science of it. And the science. And, and, and the cycles. They, they actually live underground and they build this, this mound. The mound is actually a lung for breathing with. And what they build underneath is where they live. And it's actually the body or the stomach. And we've heard about, about the, what, where they farm fungi. They use fungi for digesting their food. We use 400 species of bacteria in our stomachs for, for, for digesting our food. So in fact, what they're doing is building a body. So what, what was really good in the design team was suddenly to see that by studying termites, we began to think more like a doctor, a physiologist, than an engineer and an architect and in, in separate things. I mean, the thing about physiology is that it's seeing the whole system. And it's all connected. Yeah. How, how do your peers react to your biomimicry and using it in architecture? They thought I was a bit mad, actually. Um, but um, it, it began to make sense the more we got into it. I mean, the point is that when humans occupy a building, they give off heat. We, we are hot-blooded animals. 80% of our energy is dispersed in the form of waste heat. Suddenly, as you begin to see this, this cycle, day, night, uh, humans coming in in the morning, working for, for five days a week, going home at weekends, and, not, and then the building becomes empty. Um, it, it all becomes, you see the building not as a, as, a, as a form, as a lump of concrete, but as an extension to the metabolism. Now, I'm, I'm wearing a shirt, right? And I'm, I have a skin. And, the, and this is the first skin. The second skin are my clothes. The third skin is the building. And I, my psyche begins to, if, if the building is working properly, extend into the building, into the third you skin. become one with yeah. it. So you should have been a doctor then, Michael. You should have been. Yeah, no, that's right. <laughs> can, can we change then the world economy using the principles that you have spoken about? Can we change our levels of poverty? I know that's something that you feel very strongly about, using the principles of uh, the blue economy and biomimicry. Let's start with you, Professor Gunter. Well, it is very clear that uh, the whole logic of uh, globalization is generating poverty. The business models we have developed generates environmental degradation and social injustice. And maybe it's the best we could imagine until today, but we have to do much better. And therefore, we have to go, just like natural systems and our Earth, we have to go on this evolutionary path and look for much better. So the much better is use what you have. And the great work of Mike is that you look at a building and you save, how much energy do you save? Oh, well, it's about, I use about 10% of the energy you would normally use for an air-conditioned building. Can so you imagine? saving energy and 90 money. 90% saving, saving in the capital costs. And where is that money now available for? For other good things to do. I think we need to change the paradigm altogether. Now, everyone at the moment says, let's grow our economies indefinitely. But the foundation of growing those economies is natural resources which are finite. So for me, it doesn't make sense. You have got a limited resource that you can't perpetually be pulling out. No one is telling people that you are growing the economy from a, a diminishing uh, base and resource. Now, this is how nature would do it. In nature, you have got an ecosystem. In nature, my success does not mean that I need to bring him down. In nature, I succeed if I go into a partnership with him and we both rise. Okay. That's how an ecosystem works. Everyone is feeding resources to the other. It's not about bring them down so that I can go up. I must thank you, gentlemen, for joining me here this evening, Professor Gunta, Gamelihle, and Michael. Thank you for uh, sharing your expertise and your insights with us here on South to North. Thank you. Well, I don't know about you, but whether it's a spider web or mushroom or a termite mound, it will never look quite the same again. You can tweet your questions, comments and opinions to at AJ South to North or find us on Facebook. See you next week. Bye bye.